Have you ever felt like giving up? You kind of nod your head with me if you've ever been there before. When I think about my own life, I, I think about the Tyler Cowboys. It was a time when I wanted to give up. So the summer between fourth and fifth grade, my family moved from Marshall, Texas to Tyler, Texas, to places in Northeast Texas. And of course, the natural question is, well, well what team am I going to play football for, right? Because football is king in Texas. So we're looking for different teams, and it's late in the process, so we just got to find something. And we come across the Tyler Cowboys. Now, the Cowboys were a really good team. Uh, some of the guys that I played with went on to play D1 football. Some of them went on to play in the NFL. So they were really talented guys. Then I'm going into fifth grade. I'm not that talented, not that athletic. And my dad is like, hey, you know what? You're, you're not that athletic. So let's have you play with the sixth graders instead of your classmates in fifth grade because that will be good for you. And so I end up on this team, and the coaches say, hey, what position do you want to play? And I say, I want to play quarterback. I really want to play quarterback. And I said, okay, well, hey, just being honest with you, we got our starting quarterback. We got our backup quarterback. But you could be our scout team quarterback. And I didn't know at the time what that meant, so I'm just thinking, yes, awesome. I'm going to learn the playbook, and, and I'm going to get better against good competition, and maybe next year I can maybe be the starting quarterback. And then I went to practice, and I realized that this was not a good uh, combination. When you've got the meanest, fastest, most, a- most athletic dudes in the sixth grade in your city, and they're on the other side, and they're trying to attack you, and you've got like the backup, like Mamby Pamby, soft as marshmallows offensive linemen who are supposed to protect you f- from those guys, right? So, of course, I take the snap, and I drop back, and I'm just getting tomahawked. I mean, I'm like a human pinata, and they're just beating me relentlessly, practice after practice after practice. And so, finally, I couldn't take it anymore. So, I go to my dad, and I said, Dad, hey, can we talk? And so, we sat down on the bed, and I told my dad, I said, Dad, look, I don't feel like these guys care about me. I'm not getting any better, and this is just really discouraging. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I quit. I quit football. And that's a silly example. There's obviously many more difficult situations that I've wanted to quit in life, but it makes the point, right? Like, we all, we all know that feeling. You know that feeling. You've had times in your life, whether it's in your job, maybe there's a boss that you didn't, want, you didn't like, or your work culture was toxic, and you think, man, I can't do this anymore. I quit. I, don't, I, I cannot put up with this. Maybe you're in a relationship that just you wanted it to work so badly, but then it's like, this is draining and depleting, and oh, I cannot keep doing this. Maybe you've been a part of a church before, and you've, you've wanted to be a part of the church, and you wanted to be a follower of Jesus, and then you just had bad experience. People said things behind your back. People, they didn't talk to you, whatever it is, and you're thinking, man, I don't, I don't want to deal with all this. I can't keep doing this whole church thing. Whatever it is, we all have had those moments. I know actually this past Friday I had a mom call me and she said, hey Preston, I'm driving to go see my son. He might be about to take his life. There's some of us, and I'm sure in a crowd this large and people watching online, there are some of us who at times have thought, man, I just want to give up on my whole life. And we feel discouraged, we feel powerless, we feel hopeless in those moments. And we think, man, it would just be easier to quit. And so the question that we've all asked at a time, or maybe you're asking right now, or maybe someday you will ask, is this, how do we keep going when we feel like giving up? How do we keep going? How do we endure? How do we persevere in the midst of all of these challenges? Because they're going to come, right? We all know that. We've all experienced the hard times will come. So how do we keep going? So to discover an answer, we're going to open up the Word of God. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul and look at his life and see what we can learn. So if you've got a Bible, open up with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, uh, we're in a series working our way through 2 Corinthians right now. So far, Paul has talked about most recently how uh, he and his ministry team, they're ministers of a new covenant. They don't just have commandments written on tablets of stone, but they've got the Spirit of the living God living in their hearts. And because of their ministry, the Corinthians, this church in Corinth, they are ministers of a new covenant. They have the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they have this glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus, uh, that they're sharing with other people. 
They're just normal, ordinary, fragile, broken people, just like you and me. But Paul and his ministry team would go around and tell them people this incredible news about Jesus. And so we're going to pick up this letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 8. This is the Word of God. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then, death is at work in us, but life in you. So Paul tells the Corinthians that he and his ministry team, they shared this good news of Jesus with the Corinthians and with others, and as a result, they faced hard times. They, they suffered. They were persecuted. Life was difficult. Look at verse 10. This is interesting. We always carry, what did Paul and his team carry? The death of Jesus. Hold on now, what? <laughs> Paul and his ministry team, they always carried the death of Jesus, where? In their body. Why? Why would they carry the death of Jesus in their body, so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. To what end? Verse 12, so then, death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul was telling the Corinthians, look, me and my ministry team, we go through hard things. We're living the crucified life. We're taking up the cross. We're dying. We're suffering. We're facing hardship. It's death for us, but because we're carrying the death of Jesus, you see the life of Jesus in us. And so now you come to faith in Jesus and you can have life in Jesus. In other words, Paul was telling them, look, it, it's not that hardships and hard times are bad. In a sense, they are bad, of course, but they're not all bad. Why? Because there's opportunities in the hardship to demonstrate the power and love of Jesus. Think about it. If Paul lived a cushy life, if he played 18 holes of golf every day, and he just had a great house and great kids, nothing ever went wrong. Wow! How do you do it? How do you make it through this life? You must have to have God to get you through that. No. Obviously, no. Anybody could live that life. But the moment that Paul started to suffer and to be beaten and stoned and shipwrecked, and he still had joy... He still had the love of God. He still had purpose. People saw that in Paul and thought, that has to be real. And I want that. So here's, here's what we've got to understand. We've got to understand as you and I are in our hard times, we've got to see them just like Paul. Hard times are opportunities to show people Jesus. You can show the life of Jesus when you have faith through the difficulties of life. Now there's a couple of friends of mine that have lived this out Cruz and Paisley. So uh, here's a picture of Cruz. Cruz and Paisley were going to be uh, the ring bearer and flower girl at me and Meg's wedding. So this is Cruz, and then here's his sister Paisley. Cruz and Paisley live in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. They're friends with uh, my wife Meg. She's known them for a long time. They were born with SIOD, which is this health condition that is characterized by, you know, they're short, they have kidney failure, they have a weak immune system. And so just as kids, little kids, they're having to stay in the hospital for long periods of time. Their kidneys failed. The life expectancy of these kids is 9 to 11 years old. This is hard. This is difficult. And so one day we went to a birthday party. It was a birthday party for Cruz, and, and I want y'all to see their parents real quick. Here's a picture of them in People magazine. Look at that joy and the love and the life in their bodies. I wanted to know, how does a, a family that faces death, how do they have that kind of life? 
Because to be honest with you guys, if I'm just being real, I've never experienced like really, really, really tragic, traumatic difficulties in my life. Yes, I face some hard things, but compared to other people, I'm like, man, I want to know how do they navigate that stuff. So we go to Cruz's birthday party, and I get an opportunity to talk to Jessica, uh, his mom. And I'm talking with Jessica, and I said, Jessica, like, how do you talk with Cruz and Paisley about this? At this point, Cruz is nine and Paisley's seven. <laughs> and she said, well, we tell them what's on this piece of artwork. And I look over, and I see chosen, not punished. Chosen, not punished. Now, if I'm being honest with you guys, I'm starting to really think through this. And my theology, I'm like, wait a minute, okay, like, is that right? And should you say that to four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old kids? Should you say that? Is that really what you should think and say? But I'm listening because I'm like, okay, they've been through this. And so she explained to me, in the same way that in John chapter 9, when the man who was born blind, when people said, why was he born this way? Was it because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And Jesus said, neither. He was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed through him. She said the only way that we get through this stuff is that we believe that God has chosen our kids just like he chose that man that was born blind to be born with SIOD. Why? So that people could see the life of Jesus radiating through them. There's power. There's something real here because they have love and joy and hope and it doesn't make any sense. They shouldn't have it. It's powerful. They've raised over $1.5 million for research. Their stories in People Magazine, they're inspiring all kinds of people. One of the funny stories that Jessica was telling us, though, is she said that there is this biker gang. And this biker gang found out about them, and they wanted to meet Cruz and Paisley. And the head dude, this big, long hair, tough guy, he comes up to Cruz, and, and he's just, he just loves Cruz. He, they hit it off, and he's so fired up. And, and he says, hey, whatever we can do to help fundraise for you guys, to help you guys, we want to help y'all. And Jessica said, I don't know where he's at with God, but Cruz is showing him Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's right. This little boy, in his weakness and in his brokenness, carrying the death of Jesus and suffering and hardship, their parents carrying this burden, they're demonstrating the life of Jesus. And that's what you can do. That's what Paul and his ministry team did. So here's what you and I have got to do. We've got to carry the death of Jesus. We've got to embrace the suffering. We've got to embrace the hardship. So see, we, we can't just avoid it and think, oh no, bad things are happening in my life. This is pointless. No, we've got to say, this bad thing's coming. There's going to be purpose in it. This is an opportunity. I'm going to embrace. I'm going to carry the death of Jesus. I'm going to step into this. So maybe it's people are slandering you. People hate you. Uh, people threaten you because of your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ. Or maybe it's just you're, you got that health diagnosis. Maybe that relationship's falling apart. Maybe you don't have a job right now. And there's this recession looming, right? All this stuff swirling around. What do you do in that moment? You carry the death of Jesus. Why? So that when other people look at you and they think, how do they have joy? How do they have love? How, how are they doing this? They'll see that Jesus is real in your life. We've got to carry the death of Jesus. So Paul starts there and he keeps moving. Verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Indeed, everything is for your benefit so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. So Paul said, 
we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written. Well, what was written? (laughs) He quotes a scripture, part of a scripture from Psalm 116. The psalmist said, I believed, therefore I spoke. So because the psalmist believed, because he trusted God in the midst of his hardship and suffering, if you go back and read Psalm 116, he spoke, he cried out to the Lord, and he asked God to deliver him. He asked God to deliver him. He believed God could do it, so he cried out to God. And Paul told the Corinthians, we've got that same spirit of faith. That's us. That's how we feel. We believe God in the midst of our hardship, in the midst of our suffering, and so we speak. So Paul, because he believed specifically that the one who raised Jesus from the dead was going to raise him also, he believed God would raise him from the dead, he was able to tell people about Jesus. He was able to leverage that hardship and speak about Jesus. And it's the same thing for you and me. As we encounter hardships and struggles, we've got to think this way. We have to believe that hard times are opportunities to tell people about Jesus. Why? Because when people see that you're going through all this stuff, and you're still going, and you're still persevering, and you're still enduring, they say, why do you do this? And then you can open up your mouth and you can say, Jesus is sustaining me. Jesus is my hope. Jesus will deliver me from anything, including death itself. My brother-in-law has done this. His name's Clay. Here's a picture of Clay McGuire. This was the day that my wife Meg was leaving to go to college. And she felt such guilt for leaving her youngest brother because Clay had been in an ATV wreck. He's 12 years old, compound fracture of his right elbow uh, in three places. There was real potential that they were going to have to amputate his right arm. 12 years old. Think about this. Loves playing sports, doing all the fun things that kids do. He has to be air flighted. Thank God they were able to, to save his arm. He had 16 surgeries. 16. He didn't get to go to school for a semester. He had to stay home and be homeschooled. And during this time of pain and hardship, Clay's mad at God. He's mad. God, why would you do this to me? I'm 12 years old. Why do I have to go through this? So one day, my mother in love, as as I like to call her, just scored some good points if she's watching online, but my mother in love, (laughs) Lori, Meg's mom, she said, Clay, hey, let's, let's go out to that field where the wreck happened. So they went out to the field together. She knew what was going on in Clay's heart. And Clay, in that field where that awful tragedy happened, he told God, God, I forgive you. I love you. And then he said this. He said, God, I don't want to go back to who I was before the wreck. Thank you. For this wreck. Thank you for who I've become. Because he was able to wrestle with God and he was brought to this place of deeper dependence and desperation in God. But Clay didn't just believe in God. Because he believed, he spoke. So Clay started to speak. He spoke at discipleship group meetings. He spoke at ministry nights for the youth. He spoke to baseball teams. Here's a picture of him speaking to a group of kids. He actually was supposed to go to the Little League World Series and then, you know, had the wreck. And so he spoke to an entire elementary school of kids. Clay opened up his mouth and pointed people to Jesus. Why did they care about anything he had to say? It wasn't because he was a great athlete or because he had great accomplishments or because he was a super awesome speaker. No, why? Because he went through pain. He went through hardship. And people said, how did you do this? And it created the opportunity for him to speak and say, Jesus is real. Jesus is sustaining me. Jesus loves me even through this. And so if we're going to be like Paul, if we're going to be like Clay, then you and I must believe and speak. When you are in the pit when the ropes of death are wrapped around you and you think, man, there's no way out of this. I want to end it. 
Believe that the God who raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise you from the dead one day. That even the worst of outcomes, even death itself, can't defeat you. God will deliver you, ultimately. And because you have faith in God, because you trust God, you speak and you say, Lord, would you deliver me through what I'm going through? And would you help me to tell other people about how you're delivering me through Jesus? We've got to speak. It's such an opportunity. And finally, Paul says this in verse 16. Therefore, because of all that, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction (laughs) is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When Paul was in the midst of all his trials and hardships, he didn't think, man, ah, this is keeping me from having an abundant life. This is restricting me. This is costing me something. He didn't think that as he lived the crucified life. What did Paul think? He believed that those hardships, those afflictions, all of the the tough things he endured, that it was actually producing for him an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. And he said, when, when, when he thought about it, when he thought about eternity, when he thought about what was to come, the unseen, it made even the horrible things that Paul experienced Momentary. (laughs) Think about it. If your whole life, if you've been suffering for 80 years and and you got this much time suffering, that's all you know. Well, from the moment that you enter the presence of God and see God, there starts to be a regression. The longer and longer you go with God into eternity until eventually it's nothing. In light of eternity, what's 80 years of suffering? What's 10 years, 5 years of suffering? A couple months of hardship. It's nothing. It's momentary, Paul says. It feels so heavy right now. I understand. I understand the pain. It feels like this is just the weight of the world on you. But guys, when you taste that weight of glory, when you experience the glory that's revealed when the Lord Jesus comes, the heaviest of your suffering will be light. (laughs) It'll be nothing in comparison. So here's what you and I have got to do when we are in these positions of of challenges and hardship. If we really believe that it's producing an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, then we got to focus on what's unseen. Focus on what's unseen. Don't focus on what's seen. Don't spend all your mental energy thinking and worrying and fretting over, man, This is the financial situation. This is the health situation. I can't believe this relationship's fractured now. How could this happen? And you're just playing the tapes over and over and over, and you're just rolling it around, and you're getting eat up with it. No. What if you just set it aside, and you fixed your mind on what's to come, and you thought about eternity? In fact, I want to invite you to practice applying this right now. Would you close your eyes with me? Would you picture in your mind the Lord Jesus coming to you face to face? I don't know what you see, but I just imagine Jesus with a smile and a look in his eyes that says, I love you. Maybe Jesus embraces you in a hug and says, Well done my good and faithful servant. Come and enter your master's joy. Imagine your body, a resurrected body. No pain. A six-pack, maybe. Just kidding. No. But you see your body, and it's, it's a resurrected body. It's transformed. You're living life on a new earth. There's no... 
There's no hardship on the earth because of the fall. Imagine you're walking with the people of God. The people in this room, we're, we're having fun, we're living life, we're producing things, we're worshiping God. We're living life up as we steward creation and we rule over this new heaven and earth alongside the Lord Jesus. Imagine you're with God and you feel joy and peace. You've never felt this good. Imagine that. You can open your eyes. Just think if you were to constantly come back to what's to come and just roll it around in your mind again and again. What could that do to your perspective? Some, there might be one person or two people here who think, well, Preston, don't you know? Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither have entered in the heart of the man that which God has prepared for those who love him. We can't possibly imagine it. We shouldn't focus on the unseen. We can't know how glorious it'll be. Do you know what the next verse says? And these things have been revealed to us by the Spirit. Man's mind, man's ears, man's eyes, man's heart, human beings, we can't comprehend it. But the Spirit of Jesus has revealed the mind of God to you if you're in Christ Jesus. What am I saying? You can know what's to come. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit, giving us a foretaste. It's a down payment of what's to come. We suffer now momentary. It's a short momentary suffering. We're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. We're living the crucified life. And this little bit of suffering, just like Jesus in His suffering on the cross, He suffered and then He experienced glory. And you too will suffer for a short time. And it's producing an eternal weight of glory. Focus on it. Keep your eyes fixed on it. So now what? This is some good stuff, right? Like, this is the Word of God. But how are you going to live it out? How, how is this going to change the way you think in the, in the middle of these hard things? What, what are you practically going to do as a result of it? So there's three questions that uh, you know, I want to put before you to consider writing down. If you've got a phone, journal, take something out. I really believe you're more likely to remember and to do it if you write it down. And if you share it with other people, maybe in a life group. What did you hear God saying? When you read the Word of God, what was the Spirit and the Word of God speaking into your heart and life? Write that down. How are you going to follow? What's some practical way? I'm going to stop thinking this. I'll start thinking this. I'm going to, start doing, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start doing this. What, whatever, however you want to think about it. What's something practical, simple, concrete that you can do this week? And who could you share it with? You know, maybe you're in a season right now where you, you don't feel really discouraged. Maybe you're not losing heart. Maybe you feel full of faith and energized by the Spirit of God. Praise God. That's great. But who do you know that needs to hear this? Who could you encourage and say, hey, I, you know, we were reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4 at church the other day, and I just wanted to share this with you because it encouraged me. Who do you know that needs to hear this? Write that person's name down. So go ahead, take a minute. I'm going to give you about a minute to write down your plan to obey, to live this out. So go ahead and write that down.
So as you're wrapping up, writing down your plan, you can keep writing if you need to. The tough reality is you can know all the right things, I can know all the right things, and yet we still lose heart. We still struggle to persevere and to endure in the midst of hardships. The reality is we've all given up at some point on something, and we will give up at things on our own, in the flesh, as human beings. We're weak. We're not able to have courage. We're not able to keep heart through the challenges of life at times. So, (laughs) more important in some ways even than the things to know and the things to do is is the person, the Lord Jesus, and what he did. You see, if, if you're feeling like you're about to give up in some way, remember that Jesus never gave up on you. Jesus never gave up on you. He left heaven. He left heaven and came to earth in all of its brokenness, took on the likeness of human flesh, He suffered death on the cross, beaten, mocked, crown of thorns shoved into his head, nails in his hands and feet. Jesus suffered greatly for you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you so much. Jesus was crushed. Jesus was abandoned. Jesus died on the cross for you. If you're a follower of Jesus today and you're in that place where you're down and discouraged, by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, fix your eyes on the cross of Jesus Christ, on the person of Jesus. You've got a person. You don't just have a truth. You've got a person who died for you and gave you His Spirit in your heart so that you wouldn't give up, to help you keep going, to help you fight to the end. You're not alone. You've got the people of God who are here to help you every step along the way. And together, we suffer. Believers all around the world today, they're suffering. We do it together. This is what our Lord and Savior Jesus did. And we follow in His footsteps. Look to the cross if you're a follower of Jesus today. If you're not a Christian and you're here, maybe a friend invited you, you know, whether it's your first time here, maybe you've been here a couple times checking out church, whatever your background is, if you're not a Christian today, I want you to know that God is so crazy in love with you. He's jealous for you. He's drawing you to himself. We want you to come back to God. We want you to come back into the family. We want you to experience the life of Jesus So if you're not a follower of Jesus today and you want that hope, you want that strength, and ultimately you want to be delivered from even death, turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus. It's that simple. Change your mind about what's right and wrong. Say, I'm going to surrender myself, my thoughts, my way of living. I'm letting God have complete control of it. And I'm going to trust him that what he did is enough for me that Jesus' death on the cross makes me right with God, saves me, changes me. And if you're ready to say, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life, I want Jesus to save me, then today we'll baptize you. We'll lower you into water to represent that the old you is dead and buried and gone. You don't have to be that person anymore. And then we'll raise you up out of the water to represent that the Holy Spirit of God is alive in you and you can live a new life. You can have the life of Jesus in you. That is available for you today. The love of God, the everlasting, infinite love of the Father. If you're not a Christian today, I want to invite you during the next song. Don't even wait till the end of the service. Just get up during the next song and walk to the prayer banner. And we'd love to pray with you. Again, if you're a Christian and you just need encouragement and support, please come to the prayer banner as well. We want to support you. The team will be back there. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who's teaching us. God, thank you that the hardship that we go through it is an opportunity. Lord, it is an opportunity to show and tell people about Jesus. Help us to believe that and be convicted about that, Lord. 
Lord, help us to believe that the hardships we face, it's producing an eternal weight of glory for us. It's not hindering us from experiencing what you have for us, God. Lord, as we wrote our plans today, for those who said, man, I need to carry the death of Jesus in some way, Lord, would you bless them, help them be obedient. Lord, for those who said, I'm going to believe and speak, whatever that looks like for them, Lord, empower them to speak. For those who said, I need to spend more time thinking about the unseen, the eternal glory to come, Lord, give them the self-discipline and the desire to get away with you in the secret place and to just think on heaven, to think on eternity, to think about you. Lord, help us to obey your word. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.